on to Amazonia and to our third online learning session all about tropical rainforests. My name's Amanda and today we are going to be looking a little bit higher into the trees. Now last week, if you were tuned in, you will have learnt all about the forest floor, that section right at the bottom of the rainforest. So imagine you're climbing the trees and as you would climb the trees, the next layer you would come to which is quite a bit different and different animals found there too. It's called the understory layer or you might sometimes hear it called the shrub layer because as you're going up into the trees you're getting nearer the sky, nearer the sunlight as well and so it is a lot greener. There's a lot more plants, leaves there, um, a lot more small shrubs shall we say. So that's why it's often called the shrub layer and for this reason is why you'll find lots of different animals there. Animals that potentially are very good at climbing, so they can climb up along all the twigs and branches that are there. And also often animals that are leaf eaters um, or berry eaters or fruit eaters, and they've got access to a really good range of foods for themselves. So today we're going to be meeting a couple of creatures that would be found in the understory layer of tropical rainforests. So if you want to join me through in the handling room, we're going to head through there and get really up close to some of our animals. OK, so here we are in our animal handling room and we're going to meet a couple of our creatures today that might be found in the understory layer of rainforests. So the first one that we're going to meet um, would be naturally found in Africa, East Africa, although they are found pretty widespread nowadays, uh, they do very well over there um, as they will do as much smaller types in our gardens as well and we're going to be meeting our giant African land snails so let me just grab one of these guys here we go, now I did just give them a little squirt of water which just like us when it rains here we often see a lot of snails and slugs coming out in the garden because they love a little shower so me giving them a little squirt of water, whoops, he's popped back in there, um, it just helps them to feel a bit more comfortable and come out, and especially on the warmth of my hand as well, um, it's a nice environment for them to just feel safe and, and, and enjoy, basically. So the snails, um, you might find them in the understory layer. Now, you would find them much further down as well. Um, these aren't confined just to rainforest areas either. So like I said, they are pretty widespread in Africa throughout all sorts of regions. Um, Africa generally is all very tropical and humid. So the snails will thrive pretty much anywhere as long as there's a source of food. So just like snails in our gardens, they are herbivores, just eat loads and loads of plants, uh, munch away on all sorts of um, vegetables, leaves, anything that's fallen to the ground, anything that they can slither up to. And the main difference is um, the size of them. So in the UK, we would never naturally find snails this size living in our gardens. Um, if you do, I'd probably worry. Uh, you won't have much of a garden left <laughs> after very long. Um, but they are very, very similar in their whole makeup, their being. Um, you'll see they've got this very, very hard shell. If anybody did tune in last week, you would have met George, one of our tortoises. Um, tortoises have a very hard shell, which I explained was to keep them safe. Um, it's their shield, it's like their home. And the snails, from a completely different group of animals, a group called the mollusks, um, the snails have this big shell as well for the same reason. So, we'll see on the shell here, if I just turn it round a little bit, right at the tip of the shell is the first little coil. So, as the shell grows, it spins round, it, it spirals round. So this first little spiral is approximately the size this snail was as a little egg. So the eggs are about the size of a bull bearing, uh, but they're little white eggs. And the adult snails will lay maybe two, three hundred eggs at a time. So snails do breed extremely well. Um, hence why if you have them in the garden as well, you will often have far too many as well for your liking. So over time, from the snail being in the correct habitat and environment and having the correct food and everything, it should start growing well and the shell will start growing and spiralling with the body at the same time here growing with it. 
So the snail is attached to the shell. The snail can't wriggle out and be a slug. Um, he can poke, I say he, he or she, um, can poke its body out and pull the shell along, can poke the body out quite a long way, but it is always attached to the shell. So it is important that they keep the shell really strong and healthy because if it was very weak, um, soft, it could easily get trampled on, broken, a bird's beak could easily get through it, for example, um, all sorts of ways it could get damaged and badly damaged, it would mean the snail would fairly quickly die because it needs its own shell, it can't wriggle into a new one. Now, I did mention just there uh, about it being a, a he or a she. Um, snails are an unusual one because they're actually a, a bit of both sexes. They're a creature that we call a hermaphrodite, and that means um, they are male and female. So in that sense, all snails can lay eggs whereas often with an animal it would be the female that's laying the eggs. So snails are a mixture of both. So um, if I say he sometimes or she, it's, it's just me choosing what to say really, um, but they are a little bit of both. So here he, it, here he is poking his body out quite well for us now. Now you'll see he's got these long stalks at the top here. Now these two are the eyes. Now, the eyes then, then haven't really got very good eyesight, so the snails really just see shadows, they see light and dark. That's often why if you go very close to their eye or certainly touch the eye, they'll bring them in really quickly because they're frightened. Uh, they don't know what's there, they want to hide away and protect themselves. Then if you go a little bit lower down, um, just at the bottom here, there's two smaller stalks that stick out. Um, these are like feelers and help them smell around as well. So when they are choosing what they want to eat, they can smell around and, and see what they fancy. So if you look underneath these two little stalks, you might see what looks a bit like a moustache on the snail. This is actually the start of its mouth. And inside its mouth, it has got hundreds and hundreds of teeth, thought to be maybe more teeth than any other animal in the world. Now, when I say teeth, I don't mean hard, sharp fangs or anything that's going to bite me and hurt. It's more like a rough tongue that they've got called radula. So the radula basically crunch up and grind up all the food they're eating. So as they've got muscles that help take it in as well. So he might be munching on a leaf, for example, taking it into his body and those radula are just grinding it away inside so it's it's fascinating if you see them eat and just uh, just the mouths at work if you like so the other thing he's got is if you can see he's a little bit dirty with the soil he's got this one long foot so he just slithers along on that again it helps if he's nice and, and warm and wet just how he likes it so he's got lots and lots of muscles in there um, and he will just slither along pull his body along and like I said before, his shell as well. So he does feel a little bit slimy, um, but it's fine. I can wash my hands after and um, that job done. It's OK. <laughs> so as we were talking about the understory layer, like I said, you might find the snails moving around the understory layer a bit because they're herbivores. They go after plants, leaves, fruits sometimes. So they will sometimes slither up into the trees. Um, some rainforests have tree snails as well that will live even higher up again. And when they are climbing around in the trees, you look at the shell, it's a very good camouflage colour. And lots of animals in the rainforest are what we call camouflaged. So this is where they blend in with everything around them. Just in the same way that an army soldier will wear a camouflage patterned uniform to help them hide whether they're in a forest or the desert, they have the colour to match. So animals naturally have this fantastic way of camouflaging, disguising, hiding themselves to keep themselves safe. So its main um, task in life is to keep itself safe and look after number one. So here the colours, the dark browns, slight bits of like lighter browns, yellowy colours, all very similar colours to the tree trunks and branches and the light flickering through where this snail is going to be living. So it can hide really well, plus it's got the bonus of this nice hard shell which it can pull its body into and hide even more. And to be honest, not a lot of animals will probably want to try breaking the shell, damaging their teeth to get through to him. So hopefully he's nice and safe in that way.
Now these snails, they can get a lot bigger than this. So this, what, this is one of our bigger ones. And Sato, you can see he is, especially with his body out, nearly about the length of my hand. So pretty big for a snail. They can get sometimes the two, three times this size. So they, they do really, really well. And we don't need to hibernate these snails. So the snails in the UK, because we have the seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter, in the winter time, like a lot of animals in the UK, it just gets too cold for them and they'll need to hibernate, sleep through those cool months until it becomes springtime, that warms up, there's more food available and animals come out of hibernation. But these snails, they're naturally from very hot tropical regions of the world, so they've absolutely no reason to want to hibernate. They've got the warmth, the humidity, 12 months of the year and food available so it just means they're kind of on the go all the time and not sleeping through months on end and just able to grow bigger and bigger now i did mention there a little bit about the seasons as well so we're used to having four seasons in the uk rainforests are quite different with that now we've said that they're really hot tropical environments um, because of where they're found in the world and we say really that they've only got two seasons. They don't have the four seasons like we do. And their seasons generally are called a wet season and a dry season. So half of the year, it will be much wetter, more rainfall than usual. And the other part of the year, a lot drier, a lot cooler. So yeah, it's a little bit different just season wise, temperature wise. Hence, the animals are just adapted quite differently. And like I, said before, like I said earlier, they just thrive in those conditions. Right, so I'm going to sit him just down there for now. He'll probably slither out a little bit more. Now, we've been popping on animals onto our world map here each week. So last week, if you tuned in, you would have met our redfoot tortoise, George. Um, also, some of our little sun beetles from Western Africa. The snail here, we're going to stick on Africa as well. However, he is from slightly different region. He's from East Africa over this side, although they have um, they have gone pretty widespread over a lot of Africa now. So if I sit him there just next to the sun beetle, we can see that's another creature that we've met. Um, so yeah, I'll pop him back and we're going to meet another little creature from another part of the world next. So there we had the snail. Now we're going to meet another fairly small creature that would be found in the understory layer of rainforests. We're going to move on to another area of the world again. And this creature comes from, let's go over here to Southeast Asia. Now this island here is Borneo, the third largest island in the world. And this creature comes from the Malaysian state of Borneo called Sabah which is in the northern tip of Borneo here. The southern part is Indonesian Borneo, so it's so slightly different. Um, now, this creature is extremely good at living in the understory layer because it's climbing away. It's actually literally trying to escape the box now that I've uh, transported it into the room in. Um, and it is one of our very cool little stick insects. So let me bring this one over to show you. Now I mentioned it was from Sabah in Malaysian Borneo. So its name has got that in the title. It's called the Sabah thorny stick insect. So here we are, this is one of our adults. Um, sometimes they get a little bit bigger than this, but this is a, a good average size of them to get to. You'll see he's quite active at the moment, having a little explore, wondering where he is on my hand. And these insects are really well adapted to living in the rainforest, particularly the understory layer, because in the understory layer, as I said earlier, lots and lots of shrubs, um, sort of thicker trees there, lots and lots of branches. And an animal like this is really, really good at climbing, holding on. It's basically how it gets around. These stick insects don't fly, so they can't fly around branch to branch. So you'll see he needs really, really strong legs and sticky little feet. Now, if I show you very quickly now, just how strong his feet are, a bit like Spider-Man, he can hang upside down very, very well and hold on tightly. Now that doesn't hurt me as he's holding on because he's a, he's a very small, delicate creature. I barely feel him walking on my hand at all. He's so light, but in the trees, he's very good at holding on 
and well, exploring, moving around himself. Insects, and so all stick insects, have six legs. So you'll count the three either side and these legs are sometimes they might look a little bit spiky as well um, this often is just to give them a scary kind of look because they're really harmless creatures they need to try and defend themselves so they might sometimes have a, a spikier look he has got slight spikes like down his body as well down the main part on the top just makes him look a little bit scary and hopefully unedible to creatures that might eat insects now he's also very, very good at camouflaging. Now we mentioned that with the snail, blending in with the tree bark and the branches, leaves. It's the same with the stick insect. As he's a stick, he blends in with all the sticks and the twigs. So at the moment, he's very active, he's moving around, but one, when they're not feeding on any leaves, these stick insects generally will rest in the branches, often popping all their legs flat against their body and they look even more like a stick. So that's their best way of hiding, camouflage and looking stick-like. They can also rest with their legs out, so like he would do now, don't know if he's going to do it today, but he will stay still and start swaying his body side to side and it just looks like he's a twig blowing in the wind. So again, another way for him to hide well and camouflage from any potential predators. Now, I did mention him uh, briefly there that in munching on leaves, that is what their diet would be. A, lot, a variety of leaves in the forests. So he's not a predator of any animals. Um, however, he would be prey to a lot of animals. There are a lot of animals in the rainforest that like the odd insect as a snack or for their meals. So he would be at danger of being found by those predators. Now you'll see at the front of his body as well, so he's, he's got his head here right at the end, and he's got two little eyes, and then he's got these very long antennae, and these help him to feel around where he's going. His are super long, so he can feel quite a distance in front of him, which is useful, and he can feel around what's going on, maybe pick up vibrations as well, and underneath those, very, very hard to see because they're tiny, but around his mouth parts, he's got some smaller feelers as well. So they help feel around even more, um, help him smell things out as well. So all these features on his body um, are, are really, really good for how he survives in the rainforest. Basically because of those, he's an excellent little candidate for living in the understory layer. Now they will lay eggs um, we get male and female thorny stick insects, so they will mate and lay lots of tiny little eggs. They look a little bit like crest seeds, they are tiny. Um, and then they will hatch out uh, into a stick insect that's about the size of an ant, very, very small. And then as they grow, they will shed their skin. So many animals as they grow will lose um, their whole outer skin and they'll have grown underneath, they'll have a bigger body and they'll continue shedding their skin throughout their lives. So this is just how they'll grow until they're adults and they'll shed no more. So he's gone through a few sheds and he is of an adult size now. He's probably out of breath now. He's uh, done quite a lot of walking on my hand today. So I'm going to pop this one back and we're going to mark on the map this creature that we've met. Let me just pop him over there. There we go. And let's find his little picture here. So here we go. Here is the thorny stick insect from the Malaysian state of Sabah, which we will pin here. He's actually probably going to cover the entire of Southeast Asia there, but we can see easily where he would be found in the world. So that brings me to the end of today's online session. So I hope you've all enjoyed it, learning about the understory layer and some of the creatures that live there and how they survive there. Next week, we're going to be climbing the trees a little bit more. We're going to be visiting the canopy layer. So animals that are maybe very good flyers or that can climb very well that would live up there. And we're going to look a little bit more in depth at that. But thanks for tuning in this week. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope to see you next week. Bye for now.